Mozart's little jig is not an easy piece to play on the piano, but it's very rewarding, it's very contrapuntally interesting, and it's possibly the funkiest keyboard piece of the 18th century. Mozart composed this tiny piece in 1789. He had two more years to live. So in 1789, he was on a little tour traveling to Leipzig, the city of J.S. Bach, and visiting Bach's church, St. Thomas's Church in Leipzig, where Bach had been music director uh, approximately 50 years earlier. I mean, Bach started in the 1720s. So he was still a living memory occupant of that role, famous music director, famously combative music director, because Bach got into trouble with the church council and, and was constantly firing off letters of protest to them about the number of choristers that he had available and all sorts of other things. Anyway, he had died in 1750, and the town council famously weren't that bothered about his passing away. You have no authority here, Jackie Weaver. They, they very quickly advertised the post again. Once he was dead, you know, nobody thought of J.S. Bach as this great genius or anything. He was just a rather old-fashioned composer. He'd been interested in counterpoint. He'd been a master of the keyboard. But now that he passed away, that was that. Of course, history has a funny way of judging things differently. And about 100 years later, Felix Mendelssohn in the 1820s revived, famously revived Bach's St. Matthew Passion. <laughs> And the Romantic era suddenly caught hold of Bach, rediscovered Bach. In Germany, he became this sort of godlike figure, a hundred years or so after his death. At the time of his death, he was not viewed in that way at all. However, by Mozart's later years, by, by the 1780s, there was a new interest in Bach's music emerging. Mozart had a friend called Baron von Swieten who was obsessed with Baroque music and particularly with manuscripts of Handel and Bach and he would share these with Mozart and Mozart was fascinated. He said of, of Bach's music that at last he'd found something he could learn from. So here was Mozart suddenly discovering the thrill of Baroque counterpoint and the richness of Bach harmony for the first time, and it influenced his own compositional practice, as we can see in the Little Gigue. So the Little Gigue was written while he was in Leipzig, Bach's hometown, and he wrote it almost as if he just sort of jotted it down in the notebook of the organist at St. Thomas's in 1789. So it was almost like, here you are, here's a gift for you to celebrate your illustrious forebear. And the Little Gigue uses a tune... Uh, that's very strikingly like the B minor fugue from Book One of Bach's uh, Well Tempered Clavier, which you'll remember goes like this. And then the, the second voice comes in. And the melody itself famously chromatic with all these da-da, da-da, sighing figures. So it could be that Mozart was referring rather cheekily to that fugue subject, but doing so in a sort of hyper kind of way, in this dancey way with these cool cross rhythms. And, and everything in 6-8, you know, this is a gig, this is a... A dance. You'll notice when I say cross rhythms, the slurs are cross rhythmic. In other words, one, two, three, four, so it's going from three to four, five, six, one, two, three. So you have an accent that's falling on the. in different parts of the bar, and it creates this marvelous effect of uh, displaced accents. Very cheeky, especially if you bear in mind the more solemn. Bach fugue subject on which it's modelled. It's possible that, that Mozart also had a, a piece of Handel in mind. Handel had written back in the 1720s a suite in F minor, a keyboard suite, where the gig at the end of the suite went like this. starts off with a similarly angular theme in the minor. You can 
can imagine Mozart may have phrased it. Handel doesn't specifically put in the, the articulation, which he does in his own little jig, but he could play it with, with cross-rhythmic um, slurs. But the interesting thing with Mozart's piece is that more than Handel, he writes an intricate piece of counterpoint. So what he does is he starts off with the tune in G. And then we get the answer. So the, the answer comes as a tonal answer on the dominant in the alto. And then we get the bass voice. So it's like a little fugue, tiny little fugal exposition. We get uh, a marvellous little displaced accent. So it's going one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six. So there's a sort of syncopated thing, and that carries on into the next phrase, also just off the beat. So. one on the beat there and this is the point at which we hear the tune again this time there's a little sort of a series of uh, canonic entries soprano and then bass and this is where Mozart does something very cool he drags the harmony into the minor in a very interesting way with Mozart perhaps more than any other composer of his period there's this marvellous ambiguity all the time between major and minor uh, so that although you might be in a major piece, he's very often exploring minor implications or, or chromatic minor implications within the major key. So, for example, here, he starts hammering out the top note, which is an A. We've, we've modulated to the dominant, so we're in D major, but we've got a sort of what we call a pedal note, a pedal A. Um, let me just go from a few bars before. <laughs> to D major for the close, and then you're supposed to repeat the whole section. Uh, so it's a, it's a combination of fantastically concise writing and marvellously energised counterpoint, and the rhythmic content is absolutely wild. Right, then we go to the second half, and we have little sporadic entries. First of all, the, the bass, followed by the soprano, we're modulating to E minor. Same thing again. And then this marvellous cross rhythm kicks off. It's like a, a sort of bizarre hemiola, which Mozart makes very explicit in the notation by doing this. So you've got this sort of da da ba 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 da ba 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 da. This is a piece that's in 6 8, but he's dividing into groups of four quavers each time. Uh, with the effect that you've got one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six, like that. Three groups of four. The maths is very complicated. I'm not very good at maths, but but you've got three groups of four within two bars of six eight. So the way that sounds then is this. <laughs> subject sort of being very angular over the top. And then a kind of recap. So here we are triumphantly returning to G major. And then G minor. So you weren't expecting that. And then finally uh, hitting G major. Then we have chromatic descent. Top, riding on the top, and it's very hard to play. 
we have a diatonic descent, so it's a mixture of chromatic inner voices and diatonic tetrachordal descent from the, on high. So the mixture of that is really hard to play. <laughs> of the, the whole movement of the piece in a slightly galumphy way <laughs> down to the final perfect cadence and that's Mozart's little jig.